Welcome to Screen With Me with award-winning author D.W. Sauer. The content discussed in this story you're about to hear discusses potentially sensitive topics that include, but are not limited to, physical and substance abuse, addictions, paranormal and supernatural, extraterrestrial, mythological, and graphic violence that may be triggers to some. The goal of this podcast is to entertain and not cause harm. The author does not intend to undermine the struggles of people who have suffered or been a victim. Please stop listening when any parts of the story become too much. The author copyrights all episodes of Screen With Me and can be purchased in print. All rights reserved to author D.W. Sauer and no parts of this production may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any forms by any means electronic, mechanical, transcribed, photocopied, screenshot, recorded, sampled, or other forms of reproduction without the written permission of the author, D.W. Sauer. The following story you're about to hear is a work of fiction. Some Screen With Me stories are inspired by local and national folklore. However, the characters and events are fictitious with the exception of verifiable historical events and locations. All incidences, descriptions, dialogue, and opinions are expressed products of the author's imagination and not to be construed as real. Unconditional Love, Part 1 So girls... I slapped my hands together, brushing off the salt left behind from the fries. I know the past few years haven't been easy. I thought to myself, that's an understatement. Jonathan left for work three years ago and never came home. It's been two years since we lost the house and moved into the Long State Motel. With the burger raised toward her lip, Ashley interjected. Sound like there's a butt coming. But I have a surprise for you. I pulled out my phone from my jacket and tapped on the newest picture. What do you think? I was standing in front of a house holding a salt sign. They couldn't see the second floor or the poor state of the house from the picture, but I could see the excitement in the girl's eyes. Their eyes widened as they used to on Christmas morning. I know it isn't much and there's a lot to do, but it's ours, right? I fought the tears and nodded. They pushed back their chairs with such an eruption that they almost fell over and ran to me, wrapping their arms around me. Thank you, Ashley said. Love you, Mom, Brittany added. Thank you, girls. I promise we'll get everything back that we lost. I wiped the tears from my eyes. Would y'all like to go see it? Yes, they both squealed. We got into the car and headed for East End, named after the county's largest cemetery. It also just so happens to be neighboring my backyard. This and the state of the house is the reason why I got such a good deal in the home. But we needed it out of the motel, so I was willing to put up with the creepiness. It was a bit of a haul from the diner, but I slowly pulled into the driveway 20 minutes later. With the car in park, I looked in a rearview mirror. The girls were just as wide-eyed as they were seeing the picture. It's got a second floor. Do we get our own bedrooms? Ashley's voice went up another octave. Her hands quickly covered her face from embarrassment. Yes, you each get a room. They jumped out of the car and I followed them to the door. The exterior didn't need as much work as the interior. The paint was chipping away and a fresh coat would be the cheapest way to bring it back to life. Put the key in the door and Brittany did the rest. She turned the key, then the knob, and pushed the door open. They both rushed in and the state of the house didn't bother them. The layers of dust, the discolored wood floor, the broken cabinets, and the list goes on, but none of that bothered them. Ashley, almost 16 now, rushed up the stairs. Brittany, almost 12, was close to her sister's heels. They needed this small piece of happiness as much as I did. And as they scurried upstairs, I went back to the car. I opened the trunk and pulled out three boxes containing air mattresses. Our old beds had been gone since before we lost the house. With my arms full, I closed the trunk and went back inside. Ashley was on her way down the steps and jumped from the fourth step to the landing. Can we stay the night, she asked. From the top of the stairs, Brittany shouted, can we? We've got to get a change of clothes but I got these for us until I can afford proper beds. Ashley grabbed the boxes from my hand. Can we camp out in the living room tonight? Yeah, Mom, can we? Brittany started coming down the stairs. Sure, but let's go get some of our things. We didn't have much and could have crammed the car fully, but we had the motel for a few more days, so there was no need to rush. As we drove, the girls sang and danced in their seats. I jumped in with the songs I knew, but I just wanted to soak it in. It's been such a long time since I've seen this him happy, and I took every chance to glance at them in the mirror. 
I didn't even have the car in park when the girls jumped out and ran into the room. They were ready as soon as I entered and I quickly grabbed some clothes and rushed back to the car. As we started back to our new home, I decided to make a quick detour and grab a pizza. I didn't think anyone was hungry, but I thought it was something small that could make the night a bit more special. I'm stuffed. Ashley tossed the crust of her slice into the box. I'm tired. I didn't even do anything, Brittany added. How about we call it a night? I have tomorrow off and I want to get to cleaning first thing. With a burst of energy, Brittany asked, can we help? You have school tomorrow, I reminded. It's Friday, Mom. I just stared at Ashley. It'll either be videos or games. I'm sure we won't miss anything. Fine. But there will be no sleeping in and no taking breaks. We got work to do. Agreed? Agreed, they answered. I got up, turned off the overhead light, and walked back to my bed. The girls quickly fell asleep, but nothing I did got me close to resting. I'd love to say it was the excitement of the house, but it was something else. Something more unsettling. The hours wore on, but the feelings remained. Mom. Mom. What? I moaned. I didn't want to wake up. It felt like I'd just fallen asleep. Mom. Wake up. I think there's someone in the house. I bolted up and began looking around. Ashley was holding Brittany tight, but that wasn't the disturbing part. It took me a moment to realize that the lights were shining brightly from every room visible except for ours. Did you turn the lights on? I asked. No. Britt woke me just a few moments ago when the kitchen light woke her. Then what? The rest of the first floor turned on, and then I could see something turning them on upstairs. Brittany pointed to the light shining down. Did you see anyone? No, they answered. Okay, stay here. I'll go check it out. I got up, turned on the living room light so the girls wouldn't be in the dark. Making my way to the kitchen, I was shaking. Why would someone come in here and turn on the lights? There are far more vile things they could have done to three sleeping women. How could they have gone unseen by the girls? I looked all about the first floor and no sign of anyone. I crept up the stairs and searched each room and the closets. Besides dust and grime, there was nothing there. I turned off the lights and headed back downstairs. Did you see anything? Ashley asked. Nothing. I think it could be the wiring. I hoped anyway. I know a guy who can take a look at it. Are you sure? Brittany looked scared out of her mind, and to be honest, so was I. Yes. I looked at my phone. The alarm will be going off in less than half an hour. I know you're not going to school this morning, but you would have been getting up soon anyways, so how about we go get breakfast? Driving to the diner, I kept asking myself question after question. Was it really bad wiring? Could one of us been sleepwalking? But Ashley saw it too. Could it have been sleepwalking though, right? Couldn't have been. The only thing that made sense was the fear I felt. I had goosebumps on my arm. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. After a large breakfast, we cleaned out the motel and did the best we could to move on from the terror of last night. I think the girl shook it off quicker than I did. We went straight to work when we got to the house, but the thought of what caused the lights to turn on weighed heavily on my mind. In almost a blink of an eye, a night stay turned into a week, and a week turned into a month. An entire month passed with no incident, but the anniversary of our first night in the house changed everything. Mom! Brittany's scream was blood curling. I jumped out of my bed and ran down the hall. Ashley was already in Britt's room, holding her. Tears slowed down her cheeks. Her eyes were closed, and her entire body was shaking. Britt, baby, what's wrong? I kneeled at her bedside, placing my hand on her leg. There's something here. I looked around. Where? Show me. It went out of the room. What was it? Can you remember what it looked like? There wasn't much to see. It was like a shadow, but it was tall and it had on this mask. What did the mask look like? It had horns coming out the top and the middle and the sides. He took it off and then whispered. What did he say? I know. 
What? That's all? He knows? What does he know? I don't know. She pointed to the door. He walked out the door, and the light turned on when he left. I couldn't move or say anything until he was gone. I didn't even think about the lights. Have you left upstairs? No. I came straight in here once I heard the scream, Ashley answered. Brooke shook her head no. I got up and rushed to the stairs. The hallway and stairway lights were both on. I quickly made my way to the first floor. The living room lights were on. I turned to the kitchen and the same was true. I walked to the small dining room and the lights were on there also. Next, I checked the doors. The locks and deadbolts were secured. I checked all the windows and there wasn't a single sign of anyone had gotten in the house or left. I rushed back upstairs to Britt's room. Did you see anything? Ashley asked. Nothing. He's gone. But I'll go to the store and pick up some security cameras when it opens. Why don't y'all come to my room and we'll try to rest before the alarm goes off. I led the way as they pulled their air mattresses behind them. I don't know if Britt was imagining what happened, but I was so scared to lock the door behind them. For the moment, there was no telling if she was seeing things or telling the truth. But that simple act of securing the lock gave me a little bit more peace of mind. I helped them get settled by my mattress, and then I finally laid back down. However, I couldn't sleep. The look on Brittany's face was so haunting, and the way she was shaking wasn't just from a nightmare. It was almost volatile. She was dreaming. It had to feel like the most realistic dream one could ever have. But what if she wasn't? What if what she saw was real? But it couldn't be. It took me no more than a minute to get to her room. How could someone leave the house that quickly and not even make a sound? There were no footsteps or sign of anyone here. I reached for my phone and 545 shined brightly from the home screen. When did Britt yell? It had to be 530. It was half an hour before the alarm went off. What is it about 530? Trying to think of the importance of the time kept me up. Then I jumped from my mattress when the alarm went off. I brushed off the fright like I had a cramp, but I don't think the girls bought it. Even in their barely awake state, they knew I was scared. Just like the last incident, I rushed them out the door after getting dressed. I dropped them off at school and then went to the store to purchase the security cameras. Charging hundreds of dollars for three cameras wasn't what I wanted to do, but I needed to see what was happening. The installation was simple. I just needed a power outlet, a few screws for the mount, and then connecting them to the app and Wi-Fi. I placed one at the front door, one at the back, and one inside looking down the stairway. All were up and running in less than an hour. What took place next was an obsession. I constantly looked at the app to see if anything was happening. Another month rolled by and nothing. Not a single event happened. I never saw a light turn on, a shadow dance on the wall, or a person taking a stroll. There was absolutely nothing. Mom, please stop. Mom, 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 help. Britt and Ash were yelling for me, both at the top of their lungs. I dropped dinner and flew upstairs. I got to Britt's room first and she was on the ground crying while holding her back as best as she could. What's wrong, baby? My back. I lifted her shirt. Red lines were going up and down and from side to side. They weren't cuts. She wasn't bleeding, but it was clear something attacked her. Oh my God, baby. Ashley sobbed. Mom. I got up and ran next door, and Ashley was on her knees with her face to the floor. Are you hurt? It's my... Your what? She could only point to her butt. I walked over, got beside her, and kneeled on the floor. I need to look. She shook her head. I pulled her shorts back slightly, and each cheek was redder than Santa's suit. What happened? Still sobbing, she answered. I was just standing there, about to walk out of the room, and then I felt something hit me. Hit you? How? Like I was being punished. It hurt so much, and it happened so fast. It was one right after another. Was anyone up here? No. 
Mom, Brittany said. Yes, baby. I held out my arms for her to come to me. I don't want to live here anymore. I took her in my arms and cried. The next day, I called a realtor and started making plans to move. I was anxious to get home and to let the girls know, but when I stepped inside the house, my foot didn't hit just solid floor. My shoe was immediately soaked. I looked around and water was everywhere. It was flowing down the stairs, dripping from the ledge and pulling on the first floor. Thinking the worst, I rushed upstairs to the bathroom and opened the door, but no one was there. It was just a tub overflowing. I turned off the faucet and rushed from room to room. The girls were nowhere to be found. I called Ashley's phone, and it started to ring. I heard the drum tune coming from her room. Rushing there, I found it sitting on her mattress. My heart was beating out of my chest. I hung up and immediately called 911. I tried to explain all that happened, but I don't think anyone believed me. When the cops arrived, I walked them through everything from the time I came home. They took notes and listened intently until I mentioned it all that had happened before today. I felt as though this went from the girls being kidnapped to I'm the lead suspect. Well, you have a camera, so can we take a look? Officer Stevens asked. Yes. I pulled out my phone, opened the app, and handed it over so they wouldn't think I was up to something. Several minutes passed. We see both kids entering, but neither of them leaving. Is it possible they snuck out a window? No, there's no reason for them to leave. I'm all they have left. If you can spare a couple pictures and give us a list of places they normally visit, we'll patrol through the night. We'll also have to issue an amber alert. I found a couple pictures in my purse and wrote a few of the places down, even though I know they weren't there. Here you go. We'll keep a lookout for them and keep you posted if we hear anything. And if you hear anything, let us know. They left and I was far from finding the girls. I don't know where they were, but I know that this visitor of ours was behind it. But there was nothing I could do. Nothing but wait. Instead of just sitting and crying, I grabbed my mop and bucket and started cleaning. With each stroke, I dug into the hard wood, pushing more and more away than soaking any of it up. I kept this up for no clue how long, and then suddenly my phone dinged looked at the notification and someone was at the front door. I opened the app and looked at the camera. Girls! They were just standing at the door. Girls, come in! I dropped the mop and I ran to the door. Get in here! I was so relieved. You scared! The door was wide open, but the girls weren't there. I looked back at my phone and there they were. They were standing right in front of me, but yet they weren't. I held up my phone high. And I watched the girls. I watched them as they came in. They headed up the stairs and towards my room. I cautiously and slowly followed. Every fiber in me told me not to follow. This was not right. But I had to go. I turned the corner and entered my room. It was empty. My room wasn't on the security camera, so I switched from the app to the camera on my phone. To the right of my mattress were the girls, and behind them was it. The thing that has been terrorizing us. He was tall, thin, and he looked like a shadow. The head had horns, just like Brittany said, and the fingers that rested on the girls were like daggers. I couldn't see eyes, a mouth, or anything discernible. And I knew I didn't want to. The shadow was frightening enough. What do you want? I screamed. I have what I want, he growled. His hands stroked their hair, and my skin crawled. They didn't speak, but I could see the tears pouring. I've come for their sins. What sins? I yelled. They're great kids. Go on. Tell her, he urged. I'm sorry, Mom, Ashley sobbed. I couldn't take it anymore. Take what? What are you talking about? Dad. He hurt us every chance he got, and I couldn't take it anymore. She looked down. He took us to the ridge. You know, at his favorite spot overlooking the lake where he drives up to the edge? He got his belt out and told me to bend over. I saw the tire iron, and I was so tired of it. 
I was so tired of the beatings. So after his first hit, I grabbed the iron, turned, and I swung. When he was on the ground, I kept hitting until I couldn't. I fell to the ground. The horror that my kids were being abused and I didn't know was too much. I cried uncontrollably. Ashley and I put him in the car, and she put the car in drive and it went into the lake. For this, I have come. You can't. They did what they had to do. You must understand you have to. He gave them no other choice. Please let them go. I've come for the sin, not the cause. There is someone else who handles that. He looked down at the girls and my skin just, it just crawled. I was, I was so terrified. But, I don't like children as much. He stopped and my hoats immediately lifted. So let's make a deal. Anything, just please let them go, I pleaded. A sin of yours, for theirs. His voice was almost giddy. It was like he was taking pleasure in this. What? I find your sin, and you take their place. I felt a lump in my throat. My heart fell to my stomach. There was so much I wanted to do, but I couldn't let the girl suffer. So I nodded. Mine for theirs. I looked at the girl's. Their tears continued to flow, but their voices remained silent. I love you both. I closed my eyes and waited for it to to find what he needed. At first, I thought nothing was going to happen, but suddenly I felt it. A cold that the living cannot experience. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't speak. I was powerless. The cold started to spread through me like the blood in my veins. I could feel it spread to my toes, my fingers, and even to the top of my head. It was the touch of death. Ah, yes. There it is. He pulled away. I will come at 5.30. So now I wait. Why wait till 5.30? Why did he choose this time? I should have paid attention, should have pierced it all together sooner, but I failed my children once more. 5.30, that was the last time I saw Jonathan. Every morning like clockwork, he left the house at 5.30. Maybe I could have prevented all of this and spared the girls from the experience. I just don't know how I could have. As I wait, I wrote all this down as best as I could, because I... I don't know what's going to happen when the alarm goes off. I wrote it all so the person reading this knows I didn't harm the girls. I did what I could to save them. I did what any mother would have done. So please, someone take care of my girls. Ash and Britt, if you're reading this, know that I'm sorry. I am so sorry for all your father put you through. I wish I had known but I refuse to fail you again. Please forgive me, but no, I love you both. The pen was laid gently on the table. Moments later, time was up. 5.30 struck the clock, but no alarm went off. The only sound came from a deep and raspy voice. Only two words filled the air. I know. Thank you for listening to Scream With Me and stay tuned for the next episode. Until then, you can stay up to date with following me on Instagram at DWSour or at Polar Press Books. More information, including how to purchase my books, can be found at DWSour.com or PolarPressBooks.com.